Uh, no, I didn't see. Okay, thanks y'all for coming. Again, this this talk was easy to make actually because you'll see why on the last slide, but there's some differences in neurosurgery relative to other surgical specialties about um, neurosurgical procedures and the use of anticoagulation. Um, the problem with neurosurgery is that there is a risk of nerve injury uh, if a hematoma were to develop. So these, you know, there's risks of this with joint surgeries and other orthopedic surgeries, uh, general surgeries as well, but in particular neurosurgical patients are particularly vulnerable to this phenomenon if anticoagulation is implemented too early. So you can have temporary or permanent injury to the peripheral nerve system. Uh, that includes something as simple as carpal tunnel. You do a carpal tunnel release. Um, if you develop, if you start anticoagulation too early and develop a hematoma there, you can cause, and I've seen patients develop permanent um, median nerve injury from that phenomenon. Not my own patients, of course, but. Um, so I'm exquisitely sensitive because we've all, I've, I've been blessed with being able to learn the easy way in my field and have taken lessons from the things that I've observed. Maybe it makes me overcompensate, I'm not sure. But, um, so these are, but these are real, real problems in neurosurgery that, that I've been real careful about uh, in my practice and of course the the central nervous system can't repair. The peripheral nervous system can kind of repair itself. Um, peripheral nerves can regenerate and if there's a track to follow it can find its own chute and just keep getting that back down to the target. Um, central nervous system on the other hand is totally different, cannot regenerate nerve structures. It can recircuit to a degree but it cannot repair itself. So that's why spinal cord injuries are permanent things and strokes are permanent and things like that. If the central nervous system were able to repair itself like the peripheral nervous system, then we'd it'd be a whole different ball game for us. But so um, the stakes are high. Things can be pretty significant. On the other hand, <coughs> on the other hand, um, thrombosis and end organ injury can occur if you don't restart these medications or if you don't put these patients on these medications. What would some uh, problems be that you'd worry about to need anticoagulation? AFib. AFib, that's right. And what's the, what happens in AFib? They can develop a clot in their heart. That's right. They develop a, a, a atrial clot mm -hmm. that can fleck off and create uh, embolic strokes, right? What else? This is me forcing everybody to wake up. DVTs. Yep, DVTs. For the same reason. And the end organ there is what? Anybody? Blood clot. I guess PE. Yeah, PE. That's right. <laughs> Blood clot in the lungs. That's right. To put it technically. Okay, what else? There's a few others. Stent. Yeah, stent thrombosis. For patients on antiplatelet drugs and... Um, they have a stent if, depending on the time frame, the type of stent that's used and when the stent was placed, this, this can get uh, important. So, and that would result in myocardial infarction. So, um, so yeah, I put that first point up there just to, to point out what the literature does reflect is that the greatest risk is, is in the time frame um, proximal to the to whatever event. So if the patient, the patient's more at risk for a PE if they, you know, without it, without anticoagulation, if they're one week out of a out of a DVT compared to one year, for instance. So the closer an event, the more at risk they are um, for an em embolic uh, process to create end organ injury. So the further out, and, and two, like you say, stent, you know, the, the stents are 
considered more at risk if you're within a certain time frame and it varies depending on the type of stent but um, so you're more at risk closer to whatever event DVT uh, to create a PE AFib to create a stroke stents to create MIs stuff like that and on the other side though um, as far as what the risk of hematoma formation is relative to, to patient specific factors do they have an inherent uh, coagulopathy what's the status of their platelets are they working properly are there enough of them what's the status of their endothelium because this is in a surgical scenario this is um, you know, uh, this is the physiology that would create the environment for a hematoma if your endothelium's not working properly and your platelets can't stick there to block off the you know the incised tissue then it just bleeds and accumulates and so on and so forth so um, practice patterns it is established what is reflected in the literature is that we know that bleeding that post-operative bleeding is greatest in the first 24 to 48 hours after a surgery so that's the one thing apparently that we know for neurosurgery um, but we're always colored by our experience so that doesn't necessarily mean that after 48 hours you're good to go um, and I give the the anecdote and of course like I said I've been able to learn the easy way by observing patients who are off their Xarelto for three days have a surgery and develop a compressive hematoma and a life-changing neurologic event um, again not in my patients but because I've uh, I saw that in training um, so the proposition would be though stop Xarelto three days before you you should be safe should not be a problem but and and the relative risk there is probably true on average you're relatively safe but absolute risk is I'm sensitive to absolute risk and if you're that person that develops this problem that's very unfortunate on the flip side one would think that well you're a week out from surgery restarting your warfarin should be safe right but um, <coughs> but then again I've seen patients develop compressive hematomas after restarting warfarin even after a week um, it's much more rare starting after two weeks but even after two weeks it's not totally safe now I haven't observed anybody uh, but I've read papers where people restart anticoagulation in you know the two-week time frame that's <coughs> usually that's generally accepted and you get a you get an event that happens and the patient gets injured so what I've come is that I've established a a protocol that is kind of the catch-all for situations that are relatively safe that have low risk scenarios um, but we adopt adapt that protocol to fit patient specific circumstances so AFib for instance you're on anticoagulation because of a cumulative effect of um, a, a cumulative risk of embolic event that can lead to stroke over the short term that risk is relatively low it's less than one percent you know a day or something to that effect so to stop Coumadin for AFib for three weeks is is relatively in the, in the big picture is a safe process um, but let's say let's change the scenario and you've got a patient who's six months out nine months out from a stent and they're on Plavix um, technically safe to potentially safe to um, stop that antiplatelet drug and do a surgery um, but the risk is higher and that risk um, can be quite immediate that's not a cumulative risk it's kind of more an event risk so um, so what I've done is 
through my experience and training, um, starting with training and then through my experience, developed adaptive protocols by which I address this. So the safest protocol is to stop warfarin five days in advance um, or an antiplatelet agent seven days in advance of a surgery and not restart them uh, for 14 days after. And the literature does have some evidence, although it's not, uh, it's not very precise or very well studied evidence, but uh, it is some evidence nonetheless that two weeks is a reasonable time frame to say, okay, we can restart this. Um, that's the generally accepted safest route. There's papers, you know, galore saying that, you know, four days, three days to two weeks is anybody's guess as far as what could happen. And there's case reports all over. So um, modified protocol, and in particular what I practice is, is that I have developed a practice to, if the patient can't tolerate stopping their anticoagulation for preoperative purposes, in the normal time frame then for elective surgery. I'm not feeling comfortable with that and that's related to a recent event that we had here. Um, we had a patient who was terribly affected by his spine disease and yet was a very high cardiac risk. So we investigated this patient's case and collaborated with the cardiologist and decided that it was going to be safest to have him stay on antiplatelet agents up until surgery, reverse him during surgery, and then restart three to five days after. Um, well, and that's something that I had done in the past dozens of times. Uh, reverse the patient uh, antiplatelet drugs with platelet transfusion and DDAVP. And in the end, it seems that that treatment may have triggered a thrombosis of a stent that led to a terminal MI. So, so even though I had done that dozens of times in the past and the literature reflects that that strategy should be safe even in him, um, obviously my practice is going to be changed because we're always colored by what we see. I have a partner who would send all of his posterior cervical operations to the ICU. He'd have to lay flat, he'd have to wear a wear a bodysuit that squeezed him because, and I never talked to him about this, but he must have had a patient who had some sentinel event after a posterior cervical case. Some probably had got a hypotensive episode from decompression of the, of the cervical spine and maybe passed away or had some, some bad event there. So from then on, that's how he treated his posterior cervical cases. Um, and what I have done, though, is I've been, I've been willing to negotiate with, uh, with the collaborative services on when to restart. I think the three days is the earliest. I'm still feeling fairly nervous about that, and I try and counsel the patient, here's your risks. There could be a compressive hematoma that um, harms you neurologically, too. That and you know the flip side is that they have an end organ event that can lead to a bad heart attack or uh, PE that you know uh, that leads to mortality or certainly morbidity so haven't had any problems with restarting it at that point but if I ever come across that then I'll have to deal with that uh, but because of that case that we did have I think that I've developed a policy that if they can't tolerate stopping an antiplatelet or an anticoagulant in a normal time frame ahead of surgery, I don't want to have to reverse their anticoagulant during surgeries anymore. So we won't be able to do those surgeries. So what are the guidelines? And this is, these, I just took some snips of what a lot of different papers say. There is not enough literature 
uh, not enough high-level literature to suggest any particular recommendation, especially in neurosurgery. They have some evidence in orthopedic surgeries. They have some evidence in general surgeries. And I suspect that it's because of the variability in patients' vulnerability to compressive either epidural or even intradural hematomas, um, either cranial or spinal, that lead to, to them just saying, be careful and good luck. So that's about it. So that's what I practice. Three to five days, sorry, five to seven days before to stop an anticoagulant or antiplatelet, and ideally two weeks after, but in certain cases, we might start sooner, restart their anticoagulant or antiplatelet. NSAIDs, they, NSAIDs, well, NSAIDs uh, have a couple of different implications. In a fusion case, those drugs inhibit osteoblasts that are laying down bone. So I recommend um, patients to abstain from those after fusion surgeries for six to nine months if they can tolerate it. And that includes all of those great things that patients take for generalized arthritis, Celebrex, Mobic, um, all the way down to Advil and Motrin and Aleve and stuff like that. Tylenol does not have that effect, but the non drugs do. Um, as far as their effect on anticoagulation, though, they're generally regarded, and there's some debate about this, actually, in the literature. Again, it's kind of up and down all over the place, but um, th that they too inhibit platelets similar to aspirin enough that cautions to be warranted when restarting those drugs. So I adopt the same policy, you know, is going to be um, for fusions, you know, for non fusion operations, we're going to follow our, our typical. And obviously for NSAIDs, that's not a high risk anticoagulant, so we're usually going to hold those for three weeks around surgery. That's all I got. Let's talk about other stuff. I'm just or similar stuff. <laughs> Like lumbar spine? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the yeah, the anterior, the anterior lumbar interbody fusion is a technique that was developed actually in the early nineteenth, in the early twentieth century. Um, but at that point, the the technique to expose the spine from the front was not very well defined, and so there was a lot of morbidity. They basically were making an incision piling through the guts, exposing the spine, and as, as a result of that, it was a fairly morbid procedure back in 1920, when it was, you know, the 20s, the teens, the 20s, 30s, when it was first started, and it was abandoned. Because of that, it was abandoned to a degree uh, because of the high morbidity that went with it. However, more recent techniques that, that uh, were more precise in developing the retroperitoneal space um, has led to a, a significant resurgence, especially in the last probably 30 years, definitely the last 20 years, 25 years, of the anterior lumbar interbody fusion. So when how I explain it to the patients is that we make an incision just to the left of the belly button, then you make an incision in the fascia, and then we retract the muscle. So behind the muscle <coughs> generally is the, um, the peritoneum containing the, the intestines. So we develop the plane between the peritoneum and the body wall. And you can just dissect that bluntly by 
getting down with retractors and special in, and you know just retracting instruments and you get around the edge um, once you get around the edge you're usually able to find the psoas muscle then you take that landmark and you get to your spine because the psoas muscle just flanks the vertebrae um, you get to the psoas muscle there's an important nerve there to be careful of and then just inside the psoas muscle depending on what level you're approaching the iliac arteries and veins are there um, that coalesce to the aorta and the, and the IVC respectively so um, that's the next landmark to be careful of and I sometimes I quiz students and residents about what's what's worse injury to the iliac artery or injury to the iliac vein it's kind of a trick question because one would think maybe an arterial injury is worse um, but actually the vein is much more friable and vulnerable the venous wall is very thin and especially in elderly patients can be exceedingly thin um, on the other hand it's not actually terribly easy to injure the iliac arteries the the biggest risk is that they can become calcified and you can get thrombus or you can get embolus from from calcifications flecking off they go into the leg and can cause problems but even there it's a pretty low risk thing but they're such a robust the wall is such a robust structure that it's really you know almost have to be trying to injure an iliac artery to make a problem so we develop that plane so once you get to the vascular structures you just carefully account for those there's a plane you know between the peritoneum and those retroperitoneal structures and you just find your way down to the spine and retract all the adipose and other tissue around there and next thing you know you've exposed the disc and it takes about 20 minutes to get it out 15 minutes to put in your device and that's it so it's a good technique and actually pretty safe it's similar to the anterior cervical operation um, equally sensitive structures in that area but the technique getting there taking advantage of natural planes in the tissue uh, makes it pretty safe operation Well, right, the, uh, in the actual, you know, the, the way an anterior lumbar surgery avoids the paraspinous muscles, it's really the paraspinous muscles that are very sensitive to manipulation. And even the minimally invasive techniques that we have of passing screws, even, you know, between the muscle fibers um, are enough to disrupt and cause havoc in those muscles that they cramp and spasm and that's a strong source of post-operative discomfort that the patients have coming from a posterior approach but anterior you haven't done anything to disrupt those muscles so it's relatively speaking a more comfortable operation so the patients can usually get out in a much shorter time frame Joanna doesn't know what I'm talking about because y'all don't ever even see those patients <laughs> Were to develop a compressive hematoma in the cervical spine versus the lumbar spine, would there be more risk involved? One or the other? Yeah. The, so generally, the, the um, spinal cord ends in most patients at the level of T12 to L2. So you're outside of the central nervous system at that point um, in the lumbar spine, generally. So the stakes are slightly lower. So let's say you have a canal hematoma, for instance. Um, you can have cauda equina, and, and if left untreated, um, that can lead to permanent injury of those peripheral nerves. In the neck, on the other hand, you have spinal cord, of course, and that is exquisitely vulnerable to compression. <coughs> 
usually irreversible injuries occur in cervical or even thoracic spine. In the lumbar spine, if you can get to it quick enough, you can usually cure that problem. And all of it depends on the severity of, of the bleeding event, the density of the clot, the compression against the neural structures. Of course, those are all factors in all of it. But When I tell people post-op, it's, it's interesting. Most people really are fairly comfortable. I, I feel pretty darn good. You get those few that just are in misery. And you can, you can probably figure out which ones those are going to be before you. I wish we could. <laughs> I wish we could. Yeah. Everybody's different with this, and, uh, and you're treating an immeasurable problem for the most part. Even radiculopathies, you know, you can't, there's not a, really a way to measure that, you know, terribly ob objectively. There's, there's signs of weakness, but even, even a sensory exam, for instance, has its subjective components. Your, your subject, the examiner is subject to the patient's, you know, reply to your questioning and I mean you can even fake a proprioceptive loss, you know, if you're avidly inclined to do so. But, um, so the, these are patients, you know, they're just being a non-organic component to a problem makes it, I think, much more variable. Like that affects so it as well. Yeah. They yeah. Yeah, they are because uh, chronic opioid use does a couple things. It, it uh, desensitizes the receptors. So you develop a resistance or tolerance to the medication. You need more and more of it to have the same effect. But the other thing that happens beyond a point, um, there's also been a phenomenon observed that um, beyond a certain amount of opioid use, your receptors become hypersensitized to pain. So even the smallest thing will set you off in a big way as far as painfulness goes, your perception of pain. Um, yeah, those patients, they're tough. And, you know, I never, I never uh, presume that patients aren't feeling what they're feeling. I mean, you got to take what they say at face value. If they say this is what's happening to them, then I believe them by default. <coughs> Even in the ones that are so annoying. Yeah. <laughs> what um, bleeding symptoms would you expect with um, this type of, you know, the bleeding post? Is it just normal symptoms that you would have with any other post surgical or anything specific with neuro? Um, you mean like if they're developing a compressive hematoma? Yes. So you would you would be concerned with pain, number one, okay. increase in pain over time. Um, uh, in, increase pain at the site, but it can be tough. I mean, because you know they're already painful at their operative site, just like anything. Um, but uh, pain that seems out of proportion. Now, I mean, but there's some of those patients that, like uh, one of our gals, boy, I'll tell you, she just has really, I mean, this is probably the only patient that I've had that has had this kind of response to an ALIF. But man, she really writhed in agonizing pain. After the operation, she got better a couple days, came back a couple to the ER a couple days later, and even had to be readmitted. She was having so much pain, um, which doesn't normally happen. And, and as a result of that, I'm just using her case. She didn't have a compressive hematoma, but just, you know, I took it seriously. We investigated all kinds of stuff, and she got definitely a million dollar workup only to prove negative for anything. So increased pain at the site is probably the number one. You might get a new sensory disturbance, tingling 
um, you know, in a radicular pattern or, um, you know, if it's in the cervical or thoracic spine. That, that doesn't show a radicular pattern so much as, you know, they might complain my fingertips are tingly or my toes are tingly or something like that. But sensory disturbance isn't usually the biggest component there. Usually it skips right from pain to motor weakness. Um, either global or again radiculopathic motor weakness. So in a particular distribution. Would you mind explaining that term a little bit better, the radicular pattern? Like what do you what exactly does that mean when you're talking about that? Uh radiculopathy, um is a term that is referring to the distribution that's served by nerve roots. So in the neck, the brachial plexus uh, is started by the nerve roots C4 to T1. And uh, in the lumbosacral spine, it's L1 to S4, basically. Um, for a lumbosacral plexus. So a radiculopathy is going to be a pattern of either weakness or weakness, sensory disturbance, or pain that follows that particular generally accepted nerve path. And, uh, you know, this is the presumption that everybody's built the same, which of course we all know is not true. But way back in the days when they were knocking people off for the sake of science to dissect them uh, in England. Um, they developed, you know, they, they studied these, where these nerves went and established that C5, you know, works your shoulder and that your sensation down to about mid-humerus and um, C6 is kind of the outer part of the arm, including these fingers. C7 is these fingers. C8 comes up here. T1 does your axilla so on and so forth. So the dermatomes on a sensory, uh, in a sensory pattern is served by those respective nerve roots. The myotomes is the motor component to the sensory component. And, you know, and so, you know, C5 is considered deltoid, C6 is bicep, C7 is tricep, so on and so forth. And then there's other, there's a lot. I mean, we can go, we could, we could have a whole week's worth of discussion on these things. Um, Would it be safe to say then um, for the staff when there's a surgery that's been done to take really good note of if it was a you know, C5, 6, 7, or a T1, realizing then that if there's going to be a problem in that zone of lead or whatever that may be, kind of um, potentially. Well, in the cervical spine, for instance, you'd be most concerned about developing a hematoma that, that results in a myelopathy, a compression of the spinal cord. So at that point, you're not seeing a radicular pattern as much as you're seeing a myelopathic pattern that might affect arms and legs in general, you know, in a bigger, more global way. Um, but it is true that you can develop um, hematoma even from an ACDF, for instance, that just affects the nerve root that you're operating on. The other explanations for that kind of thing are retained disc fragment, you know, hemostatic agent that gets kind of pushed down there and, and isn't recognized and then the operation's done and the patient goes to the floor and they're complaining, dang it, this just, wow, it really zings me down here. And it didn't do that before or, or whatever. Or it did do that before but now it's worse, that kind of thing. So yeah, those things certainly, and, and you can have, and the same thing goes for the lumbar spine. I mean, L1 um, participates with hip flexion, L2 and 3 with knee extension, uh, L4 and 5 with dorsiflexion, S1 usually with plantar flexion as far as the motor component, and then a similar distribution that can be studied as far as the dermatomes and sensory paths, um, sensory patterns. 
and in the lumbar spine the biggest worry would be say like a cauda equina type picture where you're getting this saddle to put it politely a little more politely saddle anesthesia um, the, the, and then generalized leg weakness and stuff like that these are important certainly to pick up on that um, and these are things that might not even happen in the hospital it might be patient can even go home and develop these things later Yeah, so one of the, uh, I'll, I'll just address that in a little bit more depth. One of the downsides to the ALIF procedure that we were talking about earlier is that, and it's been explained as thus, it's more of a theoretical explanation. I don't think anybody's uh, demonstrated this physiologically directly, but the theory is that the uh, bone healing response creates, in some patients, is a, is a more brisk or more robust inflammatory response that creates a secondary radiculitis at the level. So patients can get, can, and usually to answer your question, starts, you know, usually it's a, it's a week or a few weeks after surgery. And I don't know if you've noticed, but that's usually when these patients are presenting. The literature suggests 15% of patients with an ALIF can develop that process. I've seen it less in my practice and sometimes I feel like the more aggressive I've been out um, where the nerve, mo nerve roots might have been running, I guess anecdotally I feel like those patients seem to get it more often, this radiculitis. So unless I'm actually chasing something specific I usually try not to get too aggressive out there for decompression. Um, I've seen it a little bit less than 15%. If a, if a patient's cold, like, let's say three days after they've gone home, and they say, you know, I'm having a little bit more numbness than I, you know, was prior, or when I left the hospital, is that something I should directly apologize for? Well, the, certainly, yeah. If, there's a, if the patient ever has a concern, what, what I always say is call us, mm -hmm. you know, first and let's sort it out that way rather than just making some assumptions. Mm -hmm. But um, the, uh, so the funny thing about nerves is the analogy I make to patients is say you've got your arm over a bar stool and it goes to sleep, right? And when you lift your arm off the bar stool, you get a rush, a tingly, kind of painful sometimes sensation until the, until the arm is back awake or whatever. It's usually a matter of seconds. Well, imagine that the nerve has been compressed over the bar stool for weeks, months, or years. So it takes longer. You can get so you can get that sensation, but it takes longer for that to resolve. The pattern of improvement of neurologic symptoms after um, surgeries follow follow this pattern, um, and this is what I tell patients. Pain symptoms usually get better in a matter of hours or days. Motor weakness gets better in a matter of days or weeks. Sensory disturbances, non-painful sensory disturbance, like a numbness feeling uh, in particular, can, is the slowest thing to get better, and usually that takes weeks or sometimes months. So a patient can report, I've got an increased tingly here. Well, that might be a good sign, actually, as it's usually regarded. Um, and I get patients that come back three months later that say, you know, I've got this numb spot. It doesn't bother me that much, and it seems to be getting better, but it's still numb. You yeah, know, and that's pretty typical. Oh, that, that varies. I mean, uh, maybe ideally they would present to their primary doctor 
primary doctor would have a suspicion um, of herniated disc or would be able to, ideally the primary physician would be able to conceptualize a radiculopathy, um, evaluate that radiculopathy, maybe even send them for conservative management, which happens in a lot of cases. Probably a, maybe a third to 40 percent of what we get are patients that have a complaint that are just sent directly to us. There's a lot of surgeons, spine surgeons and stuff that would, that, that actually refuse, look, do the workup, you know, prove what they've got before you send them to me, please. And, but I don't, I'm, I'm fine seeing patients and ordering MRIs and stuff myself. And that might result in a lot of, um, seeing a lot of patients that don't have anything that end up, you know, not needing surgery or whatever, but hasn't posed a problem thus far for our clinic. When it starts sl slowing things down too much, then I might have to implement that preference, but so far it's been okay. I'm, I'm happy to work with the referring doctors to sort this stuff out, but the, but the, but the paradigms are pretty straightforward. You know, you have a complaint. What I do see sometimes is that the patient will have had physical therapy before you've evaluated the anatomic derangement. That makes me a little nervous because I've seen patients that have an enormous herniated disc. You know, they walk in, they've got this great big huge herniated disc that, there, that is a risk for developing cauda equina. Um, and then, but they've, and let's just hypothetically say that patient's begun engaging with physical therapy and they experience an event that actually throws them into a cauda equina syndrome, you know, acutely, and that can be dangerous. I mean, patients can go paralyzed. The other thing that can happen is you can have a chronic cauda equina that can't be cured. I mean, you can sometimes address some of the parts of a, of a chronic cauda equina, but things like bladder incontinence and, and bowel incontinence and things like that a lot of times don't get better in a, in a circumstances of a chronic cauda equina. So it just boils down to how you practice my philosophy is to figure out what the anatomic derangement is first and then determine your treatment plan. I mean, we've got easy tests to figure these things out, CT scans and MRIs. You know, I and mean, some of the argument is, well, those tests are expensive. Um, I'll make a presumptive diagnosis and then start with the treatment and then maybe they'll get better. But I don't know. I think an argument could be made that you could potentially create more expense by injuring a patient by not knowing what their anatomic derangement is before you start their treatment. And then you've got a patient with, you know, a bad problem that's a burden on the medical system because they need more treatment for other, you know, a more intense problem. But I don't criticize anybody. I mean, practice how you how you were trained, practiced how you feel comfortable, and we'll all do it that way. And I'll hope I won't be criticized also. Do you see very many tethered cord type things? It comes up every so often. Haven't, I don't know. We've had a couple of tethered cord patients come through clinic, but not much. And none that usually the circumstance is that the tethered cord has already been diagnosed. Uh, they've already had treatment for tethered cord a couple times. Multiple operations on tethered cord is a it's kind of like abdominal adhesions. You know, once you get in there and start trying to release these adhesions, it just creates more adhesion. And it's more technically accurate to say after tethered cord has been released, then they have adhesive arachnoiditis rather than tethered cord, but it's commonly called, well, I've got a, I've got a recurrence of my tethered cord. Well, yeah. technically it's not exactly that, but effectively it's the same. 
All right. Interesting. Thank you. You're welcome.